Greetings, everyone. I wanted to come to you today and speak to you about how we are progressing in our understanding of the resurrection of Christ. In this book, we start to get understanding. We start to get tools. There's some things that help us navigate in our journey. And each one of these messages that I'm bringing you, I want to be able to give you more practical understanding, more practical application, so that you can start to see how wonderfully God's created you, how magnificently He's deposited inside of us everything necessary to achieve who we are before the foundation of the world. Remember, we said the foundation of the world was established in the fear of death. That's critical to understand. And the second most important thing to understand is that we are spirit. So if we know that before the foundation of the world, in other words, before there was a fear of death, our spiritual nature understood our assignment, who we are, and where we came from. Those particular pieces help us to observe our condition, help us relate to the spiritual atmosphere that is around us all the time. Remember, an atom is more spirit than it is particle. And this three-dimensional realm that we operate in physically is basically the particle of an atom. That 0.1%. That is where we spend our energy focusing. That's where we participate in this drama that we call life. But what Jesus came to show us in the flesh was that we can live in the physical and not be threatened by it. Look at this scripture. This will help you understand something. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Verse 49, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory, there is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? So you see, Jesus is speaking about the foundation of this world that has everyone so focused on this physical realm, death. So the Pharisees and all the religious people, when Jesus talks about not tasting or seeing death, they're freaking out because they can point to all these people throughout the scripture that have died. So what is Jesus talking about? We know there's a physical death, but Jesus wasn't talking about that. He was talking about the spiritual nature that you're created in. If you are spirit, you will never see death. You're going to die physically like everything in this material realm. But that's not who you are. You see, we have to break that conditioning that tells us that we're going to die, that we have to be afraid, that what's going on around us can harm us. And this is the most important aspect of recognizing your relationship with your spiritual design. 
And when Jesus is speaking about these things, he's talking directly to the spirit of man. So when you read these scriptures, after you study this book, these scriptures are going to take on a different characteristic in your understanding. They're going to minister to that spiritual nature of who you are. And you're not going to react to the situations in the physical realm like we do before we know who we are in Christ. And that's what should separate us from this physical drama that's playing out around us all the time. Now, you're more than welcome to participate in it. But then you cannot be surprised when you're experiencing what you believe. <laughs> if you believe that this physical realm is your reality and it can harm you, you're going to react to it. So this is why our conditioning has to be understood if we're going to recognize and participate in the spiritual opportunity and design that we were created to fulfill. I'm going to say that again. Most people spend their whole life waiting on something to come from the external world to change their spiritual condition and their physical condition. So they're waiting on something outside to change them physically. In reality, what Jesus did at resurrection changed you from the inside out. But you have to be aware of that. You have to be conscious of that. Look at this scripture that Jesus talks about, because this is what shows us the condition of most human beings and the people that call themselves Christians as well. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, Abraham lived thousands of years before Jesus, right? But <laughs> Jesus is saying, he saw my day. Look over in Hebrews, chapter 11. Let me show you something that the, this writer understood that's going to give you some recognition of the change that happened at resurrection. This is what we're talking about. What happened at resurrection that makes you so much different than you think you are? Hebrews 11, verse 13. These all died, Abraham included, in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Thousands of years before Jesus fulfilled his assignment, these men in the scriptures saw what Jesus was coming to do, what God's promise was about to do on this planet. And remember, I've told you several times, the only event that happened externally that changed mankind forever was the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ. That one event changed everything on this planet, changed the heavens, changed the universe, changed everything. It returned everything that was lost in the garden. Now, if you have been so conditioned, like we all have, to believe that unless you can see it, taste it, smell it, feel it, that it's not real, then that doesn't mean anything to you. Because your senses are your validation for reality. And what these men of faith saw was outside of their senses. They believed. So here's a little tip that will help you understand when you're operating in faith. 
Are you believing it outside of your senses or are you using your senses to validate what you believe? Think about that. Faith never uses the senses to validate reality. And this is our condition as believers, as resurrected sons of the living God. We don't operate from our senses. So Abraham saw what Jesus was doing before he did it because he believed beyond his senses. He didn't need his physical realm to validate what he believed in his spirit. And this is where we have to be. Before Jesus came, this was the condition on the planet. Turn to Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. You see, Abraham was in the dimension outside of this three dimensions. He was outside time. He was in eternity. And he was separated because the promise had not yet come. Jesus had not yet been resurrected. And there was a gulf between those who were tormented, those who had rejected the promises of God, and those who had accepted the promises of God. The Bible says those who had accepted through faith and died in faith were in the bosom of Abraham, okay? Not the bosom of Moses, not the bosom of Isaiah or any of the other prophets, but Abraham, who was before the law, all right? Get a hold of this now. So Abraham is in this one place, and those who are separated from the promises because they didn't have faith are in another place. But they're able to speak. So listen to what the rich man says. Verse 27, then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they all come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead... <laughs> they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. How powerful is that statement? So here you see a picture and a conversation and an image of what happens after these two people die, physically die. Not spiritually. They're still alive. One's separated from the other. And there's a great fix between them. So if this doesn't also give you an understanding that the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are still part of the Old Testament, I don't know what does. You see, Jesus is talking about something in this gospel that hasn't taken place yet. 
and it won't take place until he's resurrected. That's what makes his resurrection so profound. That gulf was done away with, and the kingdom was now over all things. Abraham was in the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God had not yet come back to its origin over this planet because Jesus had not paid the ultimate sacrifice and resurrected. So death being the number one issue here, because even the rich man thought that if someone from the dead, someone who had physically died, would go and tell his brothers about, the resur about what was coming, the promises of the old covenant and keeping the law and all the other things that were going on at that time, that they would repent and they would follow Moses and the prophets. But it says right here, it wouldn't matter. You see how the miracles that you see in the physical would still not impress or change a person enough to believe the supernatural. This is what happened to all the people in, in, the, um, in the wilderness. They saw the greatest miracles on the planet and they all died in the, in the wilderness. So even something profound like someone rising from the dead will not change the heart of a human being. They have to do it themselves and it can't be external. It has to be internal. That's where the transformation takes place. We have the most profound experiences inside of us through that resurrection of Christ that we could draw on every day and be so familiar with that dimension if we would just choose to do it. But because we are so focused on this dimension and get so stressed out, over this dimension, we spend all of our energy and secretly wait for something externally come to change our condition. So we have to really change our mindset. We really have to go in deep. And the best way I know to do that is to take a step back when you find yourself focusing on the physical dimension focusing on situations and having thoughts that start to uh, break your focus on being conscious, to observe your reaction, observe your thoughts, observe what it is that you react to, Ex observe the way you speak, observe the way you feel. If you start doing that, you will be amazed how your body starts to line up with the peace of God that is inside of you. Because you're not going to get peace from the outside. The peace has to be generated from the inside. And as you focus on your responses to the physical realm, your brain starts to slow down, your perception and responses in, uh, of things on the external start to change and you start to breathe different you start to have a different appetite you start to be attracted to different things and when that starts to take place then you can pick up your bible and you can start to read the red letters of jesus and all of a sudden those things will speak to you in a very different way why because the frequency inside of you has started to react and start to resonate at the sound of eternity, at the sound of the spiritual dimension. And when you are in that frequency, when you're resonating in that place, these words are alive. You're alive. You're truly alive. And things inside of you will begin to change. There will start to grow inside of you such a love for life, for your neighbor, for everything around you, that you won't be looking to be agitated. You won't be looking to be upset. You won't be looking at the faults. You won't judge another person because that love will leave. 
And when you start living in that dimension, God is going to speak to you in a totally different way. Because most people think they hear the voice of the Lord, think they've been given instructions, but God can only speak depth to those who have made their waters still. Most people are hearing bits and pieces of the Spirit of God, but their waters are so troubled that they're not hearing the full dimension and resonance that are coming from the Spirit. And when you hear the completeness and the wholeness of the sound of God, your whole life begins to change. And as that influence of who you are on the inside begins to expand, you start drawing the experiences of the supernatural. And that supernatural is the way we're designed to operate in the physical. That's why Jesus lived that supernatural life. He was only resonating and hearing what the sound of his father. He was only seeing what the father did. So that experience that he was having internally began to change his external realm. Wherever he went, the blind would see, the deaf would hear. Was it because he said something? No, it's because of who he was on the inside. And that external, dimension of the spiritual realm influenced the external. This is the design of who you are. I want to read something from the Apocrypha of Thomas, number five. It said, Jesus said, know what is in front of your face and what is hidden from you will be disclosed to you, for there is nothing hidden that won't be revealed. I think that's really critical to understand. If we pay attention, we talk about being conscious, being aware, and staying in the present moment. If you're focused on the present moment, then what happened in the past or what will happen in your future has no ability to interrupt what's hidden now. In other words, we're formed from light, the first day light. We speak about that. In that light is everything, both materially visible and invisible. That's how we are formed, our real nature, our spirit. This physical manifestation is not who you are. We've said it a thousand times. So the physical world around you is more of a virtual reality. You've seen these virtual reality games where you put on your goggles and you have a computer that gives you uh, some kind of images inside of your goggles and, and you participate in that imaginary world. You've, you've heard about it, maybe you've played these games. This is what the physical world is designed from, that fourth day light those images, those shadows. But that's not who we are. That's not the light of who we are, and that's not our spiritual design. So if you recognize that you can participate in this make-believe world, and you can condition yourself according to those experiences, your body actually becomes your unconscious mind. What do I mean by that? When you have an experience in this physical realm, in this three-dimensional world, you form an image. And that image is stronger or less strong depending on the emotional quotient that's attached to it. A person that's in an automobile accident, that image, that memory is more indelible than a person who stubs their toe or falls off a sidewalk. So depending on the traumatic experience that you have, the emotion tied to that experience 
produces a stronger image and it becomes like a holographic memory inside of your brain. And your brain becomes this storage of all your experiences, all of the things that have occurred to you in your physical recognition. Because there's things that happen to you at night that you don't even know what's happening. Some people wake up and they've, they've got a sore shoulder or a stiff neck because they weren't even conscious that they were putting all their pressure on different parts of their body during the night. So if you're conscious and you have a traumatic experience, it gives you a much deeper impression and that gives you a stronger attachment to the image you form, okay? Now, <clears throat> those images carry with it a emotion, like we said. So you can have a thought about that experience and produce the chemistry that produced that feeling of being afraid, being frightened, pain, all of that can come from a single thought. And your body doesn't know if you're experiencing that trauma right now or if it's just by thought alone. That's why I say your body becomes your unconscious mind. Have you ever tried to remember a phone number but you put your phone in your hand and immediately you start to dial the number? That's because your body has created the memory more than your brain. So your body is the unconscious mind that forms the habit. So we get up every day and we perform the same routines. We check our Facebook, we go on, check our emails, we see our same workers, we drive the same way, we drink the coffee out of the same cup and go to the bathroom the same way. We go through these routines because our body, as the unconscious mind, you can be asleep consciously and just go through the routine. Have you ever noticed that in your life? You need to start being conscious of that. So if you want to start changing this habitual activities that we do unconscious, then you have to be present. You don't need to try to change them. You just need to observe them. The mere act of observing your conditioning starts to interrupt the program that you're operating from. Do you understand what I'm saying? Being familiar with doing the same thing makes us feel safe subconsciously. And living in this dimension, we want to feel safe. And the way we feel safe is doing things that are predictable, experiencing things that we remember and can feel safe about doing. I can give you several examples of how people respond on a daily basis through their familiarity with experiences. Some people have appointments with people that they know, that they've had experiences with. So even before they have the appointment, their body is already prepared to experience what their image of that experience last time is about. You understand what I'm saying? If, if it's a pleasant experience, you're already happy, your body's already excited about meeting this person. If it's a not so pleasant experience, your body's going, I've got to see this guy again, I've got to say, you see what I'm saying? So what I'm telling you is, in order to change our life, in order to start to live in a spiritual, supernatural way, we have to start breaking our conditioning of experiences and images from the past. The first step is being conscious of how you're feeling, how you're thinking, how you're speaking, what you're doing. That's the first step. The second step is to start to place yourself in a position where you don't know what's going to happen. You're not unconscious, but you've turned the light out on your personality, on your images, on who you think you are, that light has gone out. So you're living in the dark of knowing what to expect, what to feel, how to react. So you've turned that part of your brain off 
so that you can allow your spirit to have access to changing not only how you act, but what you experience. How many of you believe there's emotions inside of you that you've never experienced before? I do because I've experienced it. How many of you believe that God can put you in a position that can test your trust in Him in such a way that He surprises you with how much you are in His control? What do I mean by that? When God told Abraham to sacrifice his son, can you imagine what went through him? Can you imagine what it took for him to trust what he heard, not what his senses told him, not what his wife was telling him, but what he believed inside? If you can put yourself in that position where you are absolutely confident that your physical life doesn't matter, that you are not going to protect this physical self-image that you've created and you validate with experiences and expectations, when you can put yourself in that position and absolutely surrender to what you know you believe inside, God can change your tomorrow so, so much that you will never be the same again, that that pain you used to have will leave, those thoughts you used to have that frightened you will never come back, those images will start to dissolve to give you the safety and security that keeps you grounded in this realm. Did you know that your own, your true security is in the unknown? That's where the true reality is. Because it's in that reality where the one who created you, the one that loves you more than you can possibly love yourself, can move you and direct you and put you in such a place of absolute serenity absolute knowledge, absolute greatness, because that's what you were designed to be. You were designed to be kings and princes on this planet. Kings and priests and prince and all the riches. You see, you're not born poor. You were raised that way with your belief. Nobody's born poor. They're raised to believe they're poor. Now, Jesus says in Matthew, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? That means those who recognize that this world cannot give them the riches that their spirit has. Those are the ones that are blessed. That's what Jesus was speaking about. And the first step to doing that and acting that way is a total surrender to your physical well-being because that's the first thing we think about every day. When you wake up, it's not just that you're living in the past. The thoughts that you're protecting is how can I keep myself safe? How can I provide for this physical being? When God senses that you're not concerned about this physical image you're trying to protect, He will supernaturally start to change your experiences. He will supernaturally give you emotions you couldn't experience any other way. And I'm telling you this from experience. Because the minute you step into that unknown, you're stepping into a river that will take you into the oceans of limitless possibilities. You will be creative. Thoughts will come to you that you know will be divine. You'll start changing other people's lives just because you'll be resonating at a frequency that's not trying to protect this third dimension physical illusion that you think you are. Now, that was a mouthful. You probably can't swallow that in the first bite. So you have to hear this again. Recognize that your limitations are because you choose to try to be safe and secure. When you give that up and you surrender your physical identity and life to the one that resurrected to give you access to the dimensions that are limitless, stand back. 
God's going to shower you with things that you could not imagine or even think. Now, I know many of you are hearing this because I'm speaking to that place inside of you that knows what I'm saying. That place that was there before the foundation of this world. So I'm going to speak to you about these things in our next message. I want to stop here so that you can replay this and you can understand it because I believe it's going to change your life. God bless you.